All right, welcome. My name is JJ Spoon, and I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for European Studies at Pitt. Today's conversation is focused on the 30th anniversary of the Erasmus program and the effects study abroad and student mobility have had on promoting further European integration, European identity, and a transnational community in Europe. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center here at Pitt and supported by the Jean Rene Center of Excellence. Our co-sponsors who are joining us um, are Florida International University Jean Rene European Union Center of Excellence um, and the University of Illinois um, at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, they're John Monet Center coordinators. Um, thanks to Liz Shellen and Ashley DeGregorio for their help in organizing today's event. And just to put on everyone's uh, schedule, our next conversation it will be the European nation state at a crossroads, nationalism and secessionism in Spain, Italy, and beyond. Um, and that will be on December 6th. All right, so to get started, um, the European Community Action Scheme for the Mobility of University Students, better known as Erasmus, was created in 1987 to facilitate the exchange of European university students across European countries. The program has expanded considerably over the years to include 37 countries, and as Erasmus Plus now includes programs that send students, teachers, volunteers, and those working in youth sports activities to other participating countries. According to the European Commission, 4.4 million students and nearly 9 million individuals have participated in the various Erasmus programs since 1987. In the 2013-14 academic year, um, and this is from the latest report available from the Commission, 273,000 students participated. Spain sent the most students abroad, and the most popular destination countries were Spain, Germany, France, the UK, and Italy. An impact study conducted by the Erasmus Student Network for the Commission found that students who study or train abroad are one half as likely to face long-term unemployment, at, um, and that five years after gra graduation, the unemployment rate is 23% lower for Erasmus students than for non-Erasmus students. 40% of Erasmus students move to another country after graduation, compared with 23% of non-mobile students. And 93% of Erasmus students can imagine living abroad in the future compared to 73% of non-mobile students. So that just gives you some of the uh, a sense of some of the impact that Erasmus has had. Um, the Erasmus program has been represented in popular culture and in media, most notably Cedric Klapsich's 2004 L'Auberge Espanol tells the story of a group of Erasmus students living it together in Barcelona. The online public forum Café Babel was founded by a group of Erasmus students studying at Sciences Po in Paris. Its goal is to provide information on current political and social events and issues in several languages, which now number six. It now partially is supported with funds from the European Commission. With a bit of this background, and we'll hear a lot more from our contributors in a minute, we turn to our, our experts, um, which I'll introduce momentarily, to ask what the effects of Erasmus has been on European identity, culture, and politics over the last 30 years. And now I'd like to introduce our participants. So to my, to my left is uh, Sabina von Durke. Um, Dr. von Durke is an associate professor in the Department of German here at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research emphasizes the discursive as well as aesthetic mediation of social, economic, and political material formations with special emphasis on narrative as a primary mode of communication across different media. Her current work focuses on the negotiation of the neoliberal agenda in German and European cultural discourse with special emphasis on immaterial labor. She has published several pieces in this area, including Time's Deadly Arrow, Time and Temporality and Narratives of Immaterial Labor in Studies in 20th and 21st Century Literature. She is currently working on a project, which is very relevant to our discussion today, tentatively titled No Culture, No Europe, Mobilizing Culture for European Identity Formation, which focuses on how EU cultural policy emerged after the Maastricht Treaty to address increasing disaffection with large parts of European the European population within the EU. Um, our next uh, participant is Teresa Kuhn. Uh, Dr. Teresa Kuhn is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on the relationship between European integration and the formation of collective identity. Her publications include Experiencing European Integration, Transnational Lives and European Identity, published by Oxford University Press, and Why Educational Exchange Programs Miss Their Mark. Cross-Border Mobility, Education, and European Identity, published in the J Journal of Common Market Studies. 
In addition, she has published several other articles on European identity, Euroscepticism, and support for redistributive policies. Welcome. Um, our next uh, participant is Florian Stockel. Dr. Stockel is a lecturer in the Department of Politics at the University of Exeter in the UK. His research focuses on the formation of attitudes on European integration and international redistribution, and the misperceptions that citizens hold about politics, the processes that generate them, and how they can be corrected. His publications uh, include Contact and Community, The Role of Social Interactions for a Political Identity, Forthcoming in Political Psychology, and Ambivalent or Indifferent, Reconsidering the Structure of EU Public Opinion in European Union Politics. He has published additional articles on support for redistribution and international bailouts as well. Welcome. Right. Um, and finally, uh, Christoph von Moll um, is joining us. Um, Dr. von Moll is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. His research focuses on international migration processes, patterns and outcomes, with a specific focus on intra-European mobility flows. His publications include Intra-European Student Mobility in International Higher Education Circuits, Europe on the Move, Academic Mobility and Inequalities, published in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, and The Reconstruction of a Social Network Abroad, an analysis of the interaction patterns of Erasmus students in mobilities. Uh, in addition, he has published uh, several other articles on European identity, mobility, and migration. So welcome to everyone. This is a great group of, uh, of uh, scholars that we've um, put together. And as you have just heard, we um, have several, uh, all of our participants have done quite a bit of work in this area. And so I'm looking forward to um, everyone's reflections on, on, on this topic. So I thought I would start by giving everyone a chance to um, sort of give us uh, your kind of um, overall impression of, of the Erasmus program, um, if you've had personal experiences and sort of what your um, sort of initial interest is, was in getting uh, and looking into questions of mobility and uh, student mobility specifically. Um, and we'll, we'll start there, Sabina. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly Erasmus was very successful now in streamlining the ability of individual students to go abroad within first um, the EU or EU uh, member countries. And nowadays, as you pointed out, JJ, um, you can go with the Erasmus Plus since two, 2014. In effect, you can go anywhere pretty much. And um, in comparison to when I studied in Europe, which is some time ago, um, this is a huge improvement, in particular that you have the European um, in, conjunction with the Bologna process, the new European uh, credit transfer system, because honestly, when I studied there, you lost time going abroad, except for if you were studying maybe a language or literature, then you could integrate it. And so in that regard, I think this is a huge improvement over 30 years ago, when going abroad, even within the European um, continent or borders, was highly problematic. Is it successful with respect to the overall EU idea that you can engender a European identity? I would say that's a much more complex issue. Mm -hmm. And maybe that question in that form is not the ideal question to ask because of the complexity of how identity is actually constituted. But I first give back to my colleagues. I'm sure we will return to this broader question. But undeniably so, it is a huge improvement the other thing I want to mention, I will get back to, yet, uh, to that, is um, you need to be also aware of the fact that only about 4% of the students studying today within Europe go via Erasmus to uh, another European country. And in addition to that, we might want to come back to the question of the socioeconomic differentiation. And there it might be interesting to look at different countries, how they fund their students, aside from the EU funding per se. But mm -hmm. having said that, I give it back to one of the other. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, would you like to give us your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, so generally, I would say that I'm as such very supportive uh, of exchange programs, be they these now Erasmus exchange programs or other exchange programs already, uh, you know, taking um, place in, in high school, et cetera. I also personally participated in several exchanges, both as an Erasmus student, but also as an exchange student in the United States when I was uh, 15. 
Uh, I personally all enjoyed these experiences. Um, I think it has really um, enriched my life in a lot of ways. Um, however, I do think that the impact of Erasmus is somewhat overstated right now and over, um, yeah, a little bit exaggerated. So I think the Erasmus ex um, exchange program has all, you know, a lot of symbolic power. It's one of the things that comes to people's minds when they think of European integration and what it means for, for European citizens. But um, as you just already heard, it's actually a very small number of students who do participate. Um, there are also twice as many students in Europe who study abroad outside of Erasmus. So just doing their entire undergrad or graduate studies abroad. Um, and we hardly ever focus on those students, for example. It's always in this kind of Erasmus um, um, picture that we look at. And um, what um, my, yeah, basically the punchline of my research is that um, there is a big selection effect that it's not, you know, it's not Eurosceptic students going abroad and then becoming Euro Europhiles, but it's actually students who are usually already more pro-European uh, who go abroad and then maybe confirm their existing, uh, you know, opinions and identities. And we see that even, you know, that there's even a huge selection effect into who goes into higher education already. And this takes place very early on. So I think a lot of what we see of these, you know, very pro-European students, I think it's, it's mainly due to to um, make, um, you know processes that happen in in, in childhood uh, youth, but not necessarily in university. Having said that, um, the other issue is that um, yeah, that edu these programs should reach out to a larger cross section of society, really reaching out to to uh, less you know privileged. Um, People and this is something that Erasmus is now also trying to do. Um, there's in two days there's a European summit, social summit, where they will also talk about uh, um, education. And one of their um, um, aims is to really um, make Erasmus more available for, yeah, for a broader portion of society. And I think this is very positive. Yeah, I don't want to talk too long, so I give over to other, to what the others have to say. <laughs> Uh, Florian, you want to come in? Yes. <clears throat> so um, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I think this is an interesting and great idea to actually do this um, do this now, given given that the Erasmus is in place for, for so long. I didn't personally participate in Erasmus, um, and I um, did my PhD in, in Chapel Hill, and at the time I was interested both in the factors that explain um, public support for, for European integration generally, but I was also studying um, political psychology. And then I came across an article written by, by Emmanuel Sigalas, who actually um, published a piece that said, Erasmus has no effect, um, that's the crude summary, Erasmus doesn't actually have an effect on, on creating a European identity. And from, from given the expectations everyone had and, and also the research in psychology on the role that these kinds of contact situations might have, um, I found that very surprising. And, um, and I then thought, and my supervisor thought that, um, luckily she also thought that would be a good idea to actually um, survey um, Erasmus students and a control group and, and see if I just track them long enough, if I gather data before them going abroad, um, if I survey them again while they are abroad, once they come back, and again after six months, um, do I really not find an effect or is something there? And, and I actually found something. So of course, um, the, the selection effects that Ereza talked about, I'm, I'm sure that they are there. But even factoring this in, um, do the, the people that, that we actually go abroad, do we see change among these students? And, and of course, some of them are highly, like have a very strong European identity to begin with, um, but not all of them. And what I found is that actually being abroad, being in touch um, with other people in a, very, in a very international environment actually increases their identification um, as a European or their 
closeness, uh, the, a feeling of closeness to other Europeans. Um, it doesn't have a huge effect. I didn't find a huge effect on, on a support for the EU as a political institution. So maybe that's something we might want to talk about because these two things are not the same. And I think in the debate, they are often treated as the same or maybe the EU commission thinks they are the same. But I, in my research, um, found an effect, and I found it most interesting that actually the, the Erasmus bubbles, which often have this negative um, connotation, might play a bigger role than, than we think. Um, that's my, my approach to that and the result, um, the, one of some of the main results that I found. Thank you. Uh, Christoph. Well, Thank also you. many thanks for, uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to discuss um, the Erasmus program and European identity with all of you. Uh, well, in general, I think in line with uh, Teresa's comment, I'm also quite supportive for the, for the Erasmus program in the sense that I also participated in the program twice. I spent an exchange period at the University of Valencia in Spain, one at the University of Lille in France. Um, but I'm also agreeing with the fact that um, there's a bit of an overstatement on um, on the effects of uh, the Erasmus program. So uh, my own research, which uh, actually considered several European countries, so I did research in, uh, yeah, in total, I think in 12 uh, European countries, really reveals on the one hand indeed the selectivity, which is people who participate in the Erasmus program are already more likely uh, to feel European and combined with the yeah, with the statistics we heard before, about 3 4% is participating, so we are only reaching a very, very small group uh, of people there. And then secondly, the research really reveals as well the locational nature of identities, so and the contextual nature of identities. It really depends where students come from, in which environment they were socialized, like a national environment, and the images they receive throughout their education about Europe whether they are able, uh, through interaction afterwards, to identify uh, more as a European or be more supportive for Europe or uh, any kind of things that people are measuring. So, um, for example, Sigalas didn't find anything, uh, no effect, but that's probably because it was uh, the UK which he took as a, as a case study. Uh, then Florian, he found an effect, but he only focused on German students, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So these are like people socialized in a very specific environment. And then I was able to contrast different environments. And then, for example, you see that people in Northern Europe, they are actually unable to uh, adhere to something European because they're constantly classified by others as being non-European or being up there in the North, like in, uh, in kind of the periphery uh, of Europe and not really belonging uh, to Europe. For example, there is this uh, yeah, interestingly, the Norwegian students I interviewed, for example, they really pointed to me uh, to the fact that the euro coins, the old euro coins, they don't even have Norway, uh, yeah, like presented on the map. So if you have euro coins in your pocket, you can check it, like the old euro coins. Norway is simply not there in the geography. So they're excluded, like also symbolically uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this sense. And that really reveals that depends where they come from in countries which are from part of the European Union for a long time, people are, or students are way more likely to identify and experience a positive effect compared to, to other countries which only recently joined or which are like Norway, not really uh, part of the EU because the program includes that kind of uh, countries as well. So I think that's in short a bit what I found uh, in respect to this. Okay, well, thank you. Um, lots of really interesting things um, that you guys have brought up um, to, to, to come back to. Um, I, I think I might, we might start with something I think that Florian mentioned, which was this idea that, um, and you all sort of touched on this, that Erasmus may, may or may not have an effect on sort of identity, and we can obviously talk more about what we mean by identity, but that doesn't necessarily then translate into support for European institutions, which then we can obviously think about is that how that translate translates into trust in European institutions, voting in European Parliament elections, etc. So I wonder if we can all kind of think about that a little bit more, both from the identity perspective and some of these various findings that you all sort of allude to, and then also how this why this doesn't necessarily translate into other sort of attitudes and even even behaviors. Um, who who wants to? 
Okay, yeah, I want to actually, what Christoph just said, um, you focus very much on the different national contexts. If you try to identify, um, define identity, it's very difficult. But what I heard Christoph saying is we need to think of identity as a multi multiple identities fluid, contextualized, you said. You did it through the national angle, but I think equally important are, for instance, socioeconomic um, criteria, how people yep. um, respond to the EU or Erasmus for that matter. And just to give you one little example, I found that on the Aegean website, you know, I totally agree that in the narrative about Erasmus now on the 30th anniversary, we have this overstatement, yeah, the wishful thinking of the EU, how effective it is. But I found there, which is very rare, um, a um, contribution in a blog on the Aegean, which is predates actually a European student um, organization, which came into being, I think, two or three years before um, uh, Erasmus. And she talks about her Erasmus experience. She's a young woman from Spain with um, one parent, a migrant. And she very clearly says, no, it was not really for me. You know, I, I just, just let me quote, as, a stu as students, we have this idyllic idea of how Erasmus is. Every, everyone that you know has an incredible experience. Few people answer negatively to the question, would you do it again? I have now arrived at the conclusion that this is probably because A, most working class people still do not make it to university and B, those who do it like myself probably never think of doing an Erasmus. And so she is an example of how a lot of students, even within the EU, socioeconomically are disenfranchised enough that they, even if they make it to university, can actually not fully participate in this glorious Erasmus experience. But you know, with respect to identity, I think it is a very difficult term to grasp. And if we think about it strictly in terms as the EU, and that's also very important, if EU and European identity are combined, that doesn't make sense. But I think this binarism, which we see often in the jubilant or also some of the quantitative research, integration, yes or no, it doesn't work that way. I think what um, Christopher said is so important to keep in mind, depending on how the individual student, socioeconomically, but also situationally, is being interpolated or is being addressed at a certain moment, one of these different identities, national, local, European, women, socioeconomic class, like I just demonstrated here with this quote, comes to the fore. Mm -hmm. And so I think much of the research is too confined in a binary understanding of EU integration, yes or no, rather than thinking about it in a more complex manner. And secondly, I would say what the EU has not understood is that a lot of um, the disaffiliation of the younger generation has much to do with a disaffiliation of younger generations across Europe, even on the national level with political institutions. But then the negative narrative of the EU institutions might be even more in their mind. So I think this is good to see that some of the younger scholars are starting to think through issues of identity in a more complex way. You guys like to jump, anyone else like to jump in on this discussion? Oh, I can say so. Teresa, do you want to go ahead? Teresa, why don't you go ahead first? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting finding. And um, I would say, if we think of theories of, for example, political support, if we take Easton's concept of political support, then European identity would be more this, you know, uh, more general, long-lasting, stable support uh, versus EU membership support would be much more output-oriented um, and much more subject to short-term change. So in that respect, I think it's it's good news for the European institutions if if at least EU identity is being generated because it's probably much more stable and and resilient in a certain way. I think um, if you also think of Euroscepticism, one one dichotomization that is very often made is between hard Euroskeptics who are just you know generally against the idea of European integration and uh, soft Euroscepticism, which 
uh, refers to people who are generally pro-European, who, who are in favor of international cooperation, um, et cetera, but who have some criticism with respect to how European integration is going forward, for example, the neoliberal aspect, et cetera. Then I would say probably um, the Erasmus experience can maybe mitigate this really hard Euroscepticism and um, what we see is maybe um, yeah soft Euroscepticism, which as such is not so problematic for the European institutions as as a political system because they can they can deal with this kind of soft you know which is some kind of loyal criticism in a way soft Euroscepticism much better. So in that respect, I would say it's it's good news for the European institutions. Florian, what did you want to say? Yes, so. Um, <laughs> Perhaps I, I start with a little um, reply to what, what uh, Teresa and, and Christos said with regard to their critical stance on, on the effect. Um, so I actually went back to the Sigala's results and reanalyzed them. And when I reanalyzed them, I actually find an effect. Um, and I think we also have um, more papers, like more people who actually surveyed, like did these panel surveys within the last couple of years and, and there are effects. Um, so I, I think at least that it's not clear that there is no effect. I, I think um, something is there um, and, and um, I actually uh, think this is, this is good news. Now, um, whether it is good or bad to use these quantitative scales, um, whether identities can actually be put on, on this kind of measure, um, I think this is also a bigger debate. I think we can learn something from it if we ask the same people the same questions again and again. And of course, I would love to um, have these students unpack what it means for them, but it wasn't wasn't possible. And if you want to do a a panel with 1,200 Erasmus students, that's that's what I did. Um, that's just impossible. So I, I fully agree that we actually need both. We need like I think we need the quantitative measures, but of course it would be nice to to know more what it actually means for them and how whatever it means for them, um, how that changes over time. Now um, the I. I I agree with the fact that, or with the statement that the EU Commission might actually overstate um, the effect that the program might have. And I actually saw that on the, <clears throat> on the German program website where they even put a press release on how, how strong the effects are. And, and given the debate that I know and that we have here, and, and you can witness some of this debate, I was surprised how strong this statement actually was. But at the end of the day, this is also part of a political process. And so I can, I can see uh, why this is necessary. Um, but what I want to, to emphasize is that the idea of broadening um, uh, the participants of Erasmus, I think is exactly the right direction. And um, even in, in my research, what, what I found is that, of course, those individuals who went abroad with a relatively weak European identity, they were the ones for whom contact abroad actually made the biggest difference. Um, and of course, if, if you go abroad with having a weak European identity, of course, there is just more room for change. But I think that's, that's telling in the sense that if you expand the program and include um, uh, individuals who, do, who are doing apprenticeships in Germany, um, I think this can also involve people who are working in public administrations, regional, local level administrations. You can have these sort of interactions. You can, um, you can create a program where um, people with all sorts of backgrounds go abroad. So um, I think um, that there is a huge potential for doing this. And I completely agree with the fact that, um, of course, it's, it's a socioeconomic issue. Um, I tried to put together a control group of, of students who that, that was as similar as possible to the Erasmus students who actually went abroad. And often I um, actually, uh, I ask the students why they didn't go abroad, when they didn't go abroad, when they were interested, in, and financial issues played a role. So of course, um, because the support you get from, from the Erasmus program isn't, isn't a lot. So of course, you select a certain group, and this, of course, does have an effect, and, and it, it shouldn't be like this. Um, but, but really broadening the base, I think, um, is, is a policy goal. And so I'm, I, especially in a time where Europe 
seems to fall apart, I think the direction should be to broaden um, the scope of the project rather than to criticize whether the effects might be too small. Can I just give some data here? Because I was curious about, after I found that one very negative, this young Spanish woman who was very negative about Erasmus, I actually checked, since I work in Germany, the German um, context, the stipend is now 325 euro. Um, I guess that's across um, the whole Erasmus program. And then you get 100, do 100, 100 euro more if you go to London or so. But interestingly is, and that might explain also why the Germans are so gun for, for, for it, in addition to the socialization, Christoph, um, if you have BAföG, which is the federally funded um, loan program in Germany, if you are a BAföG uh, student, you actually um, can get up to um, 1,035 1, euros if you go abroad. Yeah, but this is a buffer student, you know, and you have to pay back that loan. Um, but the interesting thing is that the 325 in Germany, the buffer, that means the federal government says the minimum you need monthly in order to study in Germany, to feed, to house yourself, feed yourself, put clothes on your back, is actually 835 euro. So the difference between what the Erasmus gives is about 500 bucks, and that's a lot of money. So I think the socioeconomic issue is something which, for instance, no one talks about in the narratives of Erasmus, but I think that is also a very, very big issue. And I don't know how that correlates, for instance, with the what you call weak, you know, identification with Europe, whether anyone has done studies, I haven't come across it, to which extent, even within that select group of university students, there might be a differentiation, which is not just national, but which is very much socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. Stuff. Yeah, here, but here we come again at the, at the selection effect. I think that that's very interesting indeed, and the Erasmus scholarship is very low. But if we look then to countries like Sweden or Norway, students, they are allowed to take their uh, scholarship. Well, they're actually funded by the state for being in higher education. So they get uh, quite some money every month from the government for studying. And also over there, we still see that these people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they um, do not participate well there is an underrepresentation of uh, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds so that creates the question also like uh, of causality no uh, again like is it because people feel uh, more is, is it really because of socioeconomic status or do they want to participate because of feeling already more european so that's well it, it always get back to the to the phrase teresa used in her paper of is a program not like really preaching to the converted and no matter what you do in terms of increasing um, increasing the funding there might be like some uh, a certain yeah, solid body of students who really do not want to go abroad and do we really need to encourage 20 percent of students to go abroad if we know that in general only three percent of the world population wants to be mobile <laughs> so no but that's well, that it's like cool. that we have these yeah, ambitious yeah, yeah. benchmarks but we have these ambitious benchmarks but I think it's it's really too ambitious because people generally are sedentary in, in, in their nature. And it's only a minority. Also, if you look at the international migration numbers of people who really enjoy being abroad, it's a substantial number if in absolute numbers, but like the relative number is, is quite low. And it raises all kind of ethical questions as well, I think, like do we really need to promote it strongly? Do we really need to make it obligatory as it is happening now at certain universities and these people from so lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they're actually pushed uh, in participation, which makes them uh, get an extra loan, which they have to pay off for the rest of their life. So there's a lot of things going on there, like in, in the sense of, um, uh, is it really so necessary? Teresa, do you want to respond? I mean, I, I, I really agree with the point that Christoph just made. I think um, we should also, I think it should also be legitimate to say, no, I don't want to go abroad and I don't want to participate in this whole Europeanization of, of our um, environment. There's also um, a very interesting uh, uh, argument um, made by callers who I will remember afterwards and I will tell you the name now. I'm, just forgetting it, who say that um, 
European citizenship, which is based on mobility, right? It's, uh, it focuses very much on free movement, creates basically um, a concept of European citizenship that if you don't, if you're not mobile, then you're not a European citizen. Um, and this, of course, again, excludes certain people who either cannot or do not want to be part of this. And this can also really create this backlash that we are currently seeing of Euroscepticism, you know, that some people think, yeah, sorry, but I'm, I'm happy with where I'm living. I like my local bakery and pub, etc. And now here come all these initiatives that, that kind of push me to, to move, to travel, and I'm, I'm not happy about this. So, so this might really, react, you know, be counterproductive. And I don't, I mean, I don't disagree with Florian that um, these Erasmus programs and similar programs can have an effect. But if we actually take together the selection effect that we kind of all somehow um, observe, and then this kind of reinforcing effect that is happening during the Erasmus experience, then we basically see that there are two different groups of people developing. One group of people, and this is a very small, highly educated, privileged group of people for whom European integration is becoming, and, and this kind of European lifestyle is becoming more and more just their normal life. And this is creating some kind of bubble um, versus, you know, the more, uh, you know, the, the broader majority who, who stays put in their national or me, maybe even very local context and who doesn't, uh, you know, co um, uh, cooperate across, uh, across borders. And I think this is a bit what we are currently experiencing that if you look at Brexit, if you look at, um, you know, other populist movements, etc., for most people with a higher education background who have been traveling, etc., and living abroad, this is, you know, nobody actually believed that Brexit referendum would, you know, have this outcome as it has now. And it actually does have, have this outcome. And I think this is because we are increasingly living in different, different worlds, different realities. And one reality for us is very Europeanized, where you cannot really take away this European dimension from people's biographies. Um, I mean, at least in my case, for example, it would be extremely difficult to just pin me down to an Austrian. I mean, that's, that's not possible anymore. But I think for the majority of people, this European lifestyle is just not there. And uh, yes, I think it's good to, to in a way, incentivize um, mobility also for, or make it even possible to give access to mobility for a broader um, section of society. And I completely agree with Sabina's points about uh, that it's something that you have to be able to afford. And I also remember in my own Erasmus experience how some students were really struggling to, to actually go abroad. Um, but at the same time, I think we should also not uh, have some kind of, you know, we shouldn't act as missionaries <laughs> telling the world, oh, you all must go out and uh, be mobile, but also accept that some people just are maybe less interested in it. And one last point that I would like to make, and this goes again into, yeah, that goes one step further, is I think it would be good for the European uh, com Commission to actually pick up on Grass move, grassroots movements that are already there. So, for example, um, Florian will probably know this, but in Germany and Austria, and Sabine as well, um, there is this among you know people who actually learn a trade, so who don't go to university but learn a trade to become carpenter or a roofer or something like that. There is the tradition of being on the walls, so actually being working not in your own, uh, in the own company where you're actually learning your trade, but actually being away from that company for more than a year. And you usually recognize these people because they wear these very old fashioned uniforms of, of trade workers from a hundred years ago. Um, and I looked up their, their um, websites and they really make a pledge that for more than a year, they will actually not work at home, but actually always work somewhere else. Up, in a different town and, you know, also 
maybe um, um, you know stay at at the house of the company owner there, etc. And I think this is something that the Commission could pick up. You know, it already exists. It's really targeted at a, a group of people that is not going to university. And just add one European dimension to it and say, okay, yeah, you already have this network, you already do this, so why don't you not only do it in Germany and Austria, but maybe, you know, go up across the border to Poland or to the Netherlands. Um, and I think this would be maybe more appreciated because it's not this, you know, it's not coming from above, but it's just, you know, uh, supporting something that already exists. Something I, I want to uh, get back to, and then you can all kind of jump in and, and, and to respond to what I'm saying or what anyone else is saying as well. Um, but to, to sort of reflect on something that's come up, I think, with in everyone's comments is this idea of sort of Erasmus bubble, the selection effect that right the, the individuals that are participating are already high, you know, have a higher socioeconomic background, certain educational background, et cetera, et cetera. And so on the one hand, right, you have the sort of group of students that we've all sort of mentioned uh, the, the, that are the ones that are likely to participate. And they're already likely to be more integrated into sort of the larger Europe and have perhaps more of that European identity, however it's described. And so you have that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have perhaps this push by the commission, by the individual um, committees in each country to encourage more students to, to do this. And while we all you know, are thinking that that may expand the number of students that are participating, um, what I wonder how much the goal perhaps is, is not only to create this somewhat of this, this identity, but to and then the effect of that, of course, is that we have perhaps less support for political parties, right? Sort of the, the populist wave that's that's going across Europe now, the sort of hard Euroskeptics um, in the way of, of uh, Gerd Wilders or, or uh, Marine Le Pen, Farage in the UK, etc. And so we are, have this group of individuals that is already likely to not support that, that those types of parties because they're already sort of not in that kind of demographic group already. They're already feeling more cosmopolitan, more European. And so but then on the other hand, you have sort of the, 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 the commission, the governments themselves promoting this. So is there a way to kind of reconcile this? In other words, perhaps with the group that's, that's currently participating, we're not going to see any their voting patterns have already been established and they're not supporting these kinds of these kinds of parties but then you have another group that is and so is the goal perhaps to get more people participating that are perhaps more uh, likely to support these sort of nationalist or Euroskeptic parties? That's a difficult question. <laughs> I don't know. Um... Because I really do think it misses somewhat the mark because I think a lot of young people, what they have seen, if, you know, and, and I, I don't have even for Germany right now, um, the age, the generational breakdown for the AfD, for the Alternative for Deutschland, maybe one of you has that. But it seems to me there is a general malaise, a general distrust of the political class mm -hmm. among younger um, Germans. You know, some are gung ho, but so I don't have percentages, but there seems to be, I'm not sure whether the Erasmus was even designed to really affect voting. It was more really to come on board with the European integration process. Mm -hmm. What we haven't addressed yet is in the early stages, it was really, if you look, the program has evolved of the history of Erasmus. It was very much the cultural, the idea of land which is cultural exchange promoting um, understanding hopefully more peaceful cohabitation uh, in Europe, but then it shifted, particularly since um, I think it's about 2007 when they changed the program significantly more towards economic goals mm -hmm. uh, in terms of globalization. And I think that motivated some of the students to go just for one semester, because now, I mean, I, we haven't talked about that, but the majority of the students go for one semester. And I would say that's a very, very short period of time. We are talking four months abroad. And that does not give you enough time to develop the roots in individual interpersonal contexts um, in order to re really um, develop a strong sense of this other local as a second home within mm -hmm. Europe. But so I would say, I, I don't know, I don't see that direct effect on the voting, but more alongside the cultural policy of the EU, we have a shift towards 
the economic becoming Europe a competitive labor force in under the pressure of globalization. Mm -hmm. You know, so but I don't know. Does any one of you have data on how it breaks down? You know, in terms of generations who votes for these right-wing populists within Europe? Well, for example, for um, for Brexit, we know that the younger generations were actually mo much more likely to vote for to remain in the European Union. Correct. Yeah. Um, and in general, um, there's quite some data that shows that younger people are actually more pro-European and more, you know, open towards it. That's what I thought. Um, I think with the voting behavior, I don't think it is really a, a direct goal of the European Commission. At least I have never seen it in any any one of the policy documents. And the latest documents I have seen are actually in preparation for the European Social Summit that is um, taking place in two days. And there, there we're focusing again very much on European identity, which did surprise me because as you said, Sabine, we saw a move towards much more, okay, employability, uh, labor market, mobility, et cetera. But they seem to be now more, again, focusing on this cultural aspect and the identity aspect. But however, what we do know about voting behavior among mobile people is that a lot of them, of course, don't vote because they have to vote from abroad. Um, they're often not registered where they are supposed to be voting, etc. So it makes it all a bit more difficult. They also sometimes become detached from uh, their communities. But um, thinking of my own home country, Austria, we do know that um, People who vote from abroad or who vote via, you know, postal um, votes are usually much less likely to vote for for the um, extreme right parties. So just in the last elections, um, this was again a bit of an issue. You know, everybody was nervous about the last postal votes coming in, whether and in indeed this this um, resulted in the Social Democrats being number two instead of the extreme right being number two. So um, this shows that people who are abroad um, are usually much less likely to vote for these extreme parties. But again, is this because of their experience abroad or is it because of their general, you know, um, bigger propensity to, to embrace cosmopolitan values? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question. Mm -hmm. uh, Christoph and then, and then Florian. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting in this discussion, of course, is again that um, we all focus on, on mobility and, and we kind of also follow the, the logic of the European Commission, uh, like to, to be interested in the relationship between mobility and, and European identity, uh, which indeed uh, I also read the document yesterday uh, is becoming again on the, which is again on the agenda. Um, but. Uh, I think, like, isn't it a way forward maybe to really focus on um, the same for the for the programs you you mentioned, Teresa, to focus on best practices for interaction with those who do not move, because actually a lot of money is spent on uh, on promoting participation and on creating European identity in that sense because of the participation and the socialization. But actually, there's not a lot of attention, or at least not in my opinion, to what are good practices to put students uh, who are not willing to be mobile into really like profound contact uh, with those who move? I think we, we also talked before about the Erasmus bubble. And of course, these people, they create, they might create a sense of European identity. But shouldn't there be like more focus on interaction with those who do not move like as a way forward? Just... Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting um, interesting idea. It's also something that um, I noticed myself when going abroad, that for example, I, I did my PhD in Florence um, at the European University Institute, and uh, we were of course in a very international crowd of people, and it was very difficult to get in contact with, you know, Italian students not being at the uni European University Institute, but just at the University of Florence. And uh, I, I did my best and I thought a lot about why was this the case. And at some point I thought, yeah, actually these are different students than the ones we are. I mean, they actually chose to stay in their home country. And whereas a lot of Italian students 
choose to go to London and, and pursue their studies there or to another, you know, do their entire studies there. So I thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's in a way understandable that we have difficulties getting in touch with, with these local students because they are in a way um, choosing a very different life than, than, you know, this very international group of students that we are, that we were at the EUI. And uh, I, I mean, I think also with respect to, you know, to rising populism, you know, Euroscepticism and nationalism, I think it is important to actually um, maybe focus less on these international experiences, but maybe more on, on you know, talking once to, to a, you know, nationalist, uh, to somebody from Pegida, get in touch with them and actually try to, I mean, it's hard to understand everything, but, you know, to, to kind of at least have empathy <coughs> to some of these arguments. And I think there we are very much getting into different, again, into different bubbles that are maybe not so much nationalized, but much more uh, along socioeconomic um, lines. And, and one point that I would like to make about, um, again, the selection effect, um, I, I'm very uh, sympathetic to Sabina's uh, proposal to give more money in order to uh, support uh, uh, poorer students, but at the end of the day, students, university students, are a pretty privileged group of students uh, of, of people. And I'm just thinking of the typical, um, you know, Eurosceptic person who then here, who maybe has not had a you know very privileged life herself, and then hears, oh, and now you know, these, these rich students get even more money to actually go abroad. Um, so this might again create some kind of backlash. Um, and um, I'm currently doing a study where we look at, at panel data, um, looking at students from the age of 13 until they're 30. And what we can see uh, there is that these educational differences in Euroscepticism um, exist already at the age of 13. So um, already then we see that people who will later on not go to university are much more likely to be Eurosceptical than um, people who will actually go to university. And we don't see an increase in, uh, in this difference. So it actually shows us that this sorting into, you know, pro-Europeans who will actually go to university and Eurosceptics who will not go to university happens at a very early stage in life. And it's very much predetermined also by uh, parental background, so whether your parents went to university or not and what your parents think of European integration. And um, so again here, I think if there are these mobility programs, they probably should start very early or if there are, you know, um, um, other initiatives to kind of tackle these differences in attitudes towards European integration, they probably should start out uh, at a very, you know, t you know, address really children already. Yeah. So I think what we're, we're hearing, which I think um, is, is true with many things, is that this is a much more complicated um, uh, dynamic, right? It's not just necessarily about sort of age and socioeconomic status, but it's also about how you were raised and what your parents' situation was as well in terms of thinking about those that are, you know, more primed to already be interested, not only in university education, but also interested in sort of a more international um, outlook as well. Um, and so it's, and I think this is really interesting, this, this study, Teresa, that you're, that you're conducting now, that it's going back to a, a time when, uh, you know, ch effectively, you know, individuals are still children and they're still very much influenced by their, you know, the socialization of their parents and their communities and things like that and how that's almost sort of, you know, setting them up to then be, you know, either heading in towards university and then be interested in sort of then taking the next step and going abroad. And so, you know, what's, what I think that says is that if we want to create, you know, a larger sort of Erasmus uh, community that we really need to go back to, you know, elementary school really and start thinking about sort of how, um, you know, students are being, uh, how Europe is being discussed and, and about sort of the international community and really trying to overcome some of these 
so, you know, selection effects that we've all mentioned in terms of, especially when it comes to sort of parental background and education and socioeconomic status and like that. I want to give Florian a chance to, to respond to, to all of these things since we, oh, we keep passing over, over. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly won't react to everything, but but I do want to say a few yeah. things with regard to, to the issues that came up. So first, um, the, the Brexit referendum came up and the fact that, that young people um, are particularly pro-European. Um, the problem with young people in Britain was that they didn't turn up um, and, and vote uh, for. So um, I think um, that, that um, and I, that's just like a hypothesis. If more of them had been abroad and knew about the um, benefits, maybe they would have made the decision to actually participate in the process. But um, the, what I wanted to say in, uh, with regard to this issue of a widening gap uh, between individuals who might be already pro-European or more cosmopolitan to begin with and those who, who are not. And, and, and I, I had the impression that there is this argument actually because they already have those views, we don't need to uh, do so much. We shouldn't spend taxpayer money on it. And so, and, and I really don't think that in this time, we can take anything for granted. So I don't think that um, just because we have individuals who might be a little bit more pro-European, pro-European students, that uh, not giving them the opportunity to go abroad or facilitating um, these, these, uh, these study abroads, um, that uh, this, this might be a good idea. I think. Um, um, and I'm, I'm saying this in particular because there is often this criticism that only political elites are pro-European, that it is only the parties who push for, for that uh, political project of, of Europe. And I think we need more than, than just some parties uh, saying this. I think uh, we, we need um, more people um, who experienced or who, uh, Europe in, in a very personal way. And I think um, Europe shouldn't be just about creating this market and, and decreasing roaming um, charges. This is all great. But I think actually that, that it is part of the project to also make it possible or to also create as many interactions between the citizens. And, and then, because you also mentioned nationalism, I, I, I think we shouldn't just see a European identity or the, the a European identity as the goal. For me, a European identity, you could also translate it in, into a cosmopolitanism. Or if you take it one step further down, it's just openness towards diversity. And, and this is, I think, what, what is the minimum that, that we really need so that Europe's countries don't close their borders. And then I, I think we need as many people as possible who have ties to, to citizens in other countries who experience Europe in a very personal way, because it might actually them who then talk to their friends, it might have been the only person who ever went abroad. But maybe this is this is something that that really shaped this person's way of talking to friends in political discussions, and and so it's not just a politician from a pro-European party, but it's someone who actually for whom um, Europe means something very personal. And I think this really doesn't go against the fact that people want to um, to have a very local context that they enjoy. Because um, Christoph, I don't know if you used the the example of a local bakery. I th I think this is not the issue. I don't think that that this European Europeanization goes against these um, against having strong local ties. Uh, I, this idea of like seeing even a push. Um, I I don't think we should think of it this way. I think Europeanization in in this way means um, creating citizens or or creating a situation where citizens are able to see individuals in other countries as peers, where they are not foreign, they are just like me, they just happen to live in another country. And, and this is, I mean, given the history and the nationalism in Europe, um, I think um, we need everything, we need to do everything we can in order to, to, help, to help this pathway. And finally, I wanted to say something um, with regard to actually other groups of people um, with whom we should get in touch. And um, there are already lots of people who are abroad and they are not students. Um, here in the UK, there are lots of workers who come to the UK um, because they need the jobs 
here and to, who are not connected to universities. They are not students. Um, they are not part of the Erasmus program. And, and there is very little interaction. There is even very little research on it. And, and I think this goes back to a point that Christoph made um, at the very beginning that um, people from different countries might be treated very differently and being abroad might mean very different things for different people, which has to do with, with social, uh, social status and how, how individuals might be integrated in their host societies. So um, that's that's a whole other issue um, that that we didn't touch upon since it's about Erasmus, completely understandable. But there is more going on with regard to just European migration. Um, yeah, to the Erasmus, um, we talked about the old Erasmus, the Erasmus Plus, which is in effect since 2014 through 2020. Uh, it is important to re remember that with the Erasmus Plus, for instance, administrators in, edu a, in educational institutions have opportunities now. And also the, what was it, Leonardo da Vinci was the, what um, Teresa addressed was the vocational training or education aspect of it has been integrated. So I think this broadening is happening that we don't see any research is in some ways logical because we always run two years behind with our data, right? Um, it's just too new. But so I think that, and I agree also with what um, uh, Florian said, it's important to keep this going. But what I want to um, share with you is an observation right now in our, our conversation. We have more and more slipped towards, JJ, you did that from Europeanization or European to cosmopolitan. And I think Florian's pitch right now proves my point that I want to make now is I think for a lot of young Europeans, Europeanization as a lived experience, traveling in various forms, uh, trans-border um, uh, cultural activities, et cetera, is a lived reality. This lived reality is very different from the top-down top EU understanding of European identity. So I would agree there is a strong um, European identity among young Europeans. Then they thought, well, that's because they grew up that way. I mean, look at yourself when you were born. I mean, I'm so old that I remember when the first European parliamentary election happened. That was a big thing. We were enthusiastic, particularly if you grew up in the southwest of Germany, like two hours from the French border, an hour and 10 minutes out of the TGV to the Strasbourg, where, uh, where I grew up. But so I think it has, it's normal in some ways for, for young Europeans to be not thinking much about Europe. And I think that most of the younger generation, and that's where we all slip up with cosmopolitan, they have a very cosmopolitan perspective. Yeah. And uh, not all of them, but many have that, particularly those who have the opportunity to participate in various exchanges or also just travel. Yeah. So I think a lot of times it seems to me there's a generational split between the upper echelon, somewhat older in the EU, who are very Eurocentric, because I'm talking about the generation now, you know, born at the end of the war through the 60s, who have a clear memory of the process, the, um, uh, the long history of the European integration. And I'm not kidding you. I mean, we were enthusiastic about that. Finally, you could vote for European Parliament. You guys don't even know that, but initially the European Parliament was really just a little joking, funny little place you went visit, but had no power. So I think that one of the issues I see also is, and that has not so much to do with Erasmus, but is a generational split between, well, we have a much more cosmopolitan um, view, and this is borne out in some of the research I just started on this initiative, A Soul, of, um, a Soul for Europe, um, where the older generation talks in very affective terms, soul and Europe and European values, and the younger generation involved, they are the strategy group, these young people, either they are very much on board with the neoliberal regime, you know, so they use it as promoting their professional careers, why not? Or they have a hard time to really speak about Europe. They talk about opening, you know, we need to open to Africa, we need to be cosmopolitan, or what Florian just said, this idea that we cannot have the best in Europa. You know, um, so I think that that plays also a role. But again, I still think, yes, Florian, you're right. We should not, even if the EU overstates it, we should not give up on these programs. And clearly there is a political uh, economic issue. The EU are those people who 
when the pot is divided, who want to have more funds, of course, need to overstate the effect, you know, of um, Erasmus in order to get, get the pots um, full again. But um, I, I also think that uh, it really did have a little bit of an effect, but not in the sense of EU integration, but more a normalization of, yes, I'm European. And again, I come back to that. And I guess uh, Christoph will second me there. Depending on how you are dressed, there are moments when I'm traveling where I feel very European, although I have lived for longer in the US now than in um, Germany or in Europe. And then there are moments where I feel in Europe very American. So it depends on how, what's the situation. But I think the generational split I see is becoming more pronounced. And for some of you, Europe is a normality. And I think some of the EU upper echelon of a certain generation doesn't seem to, have, you don't speak the same language. They don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. They want to circle the wagon. Mm -hmm. They want to get us all on board, the young people, rather than understanding that this younger generation of Europeans is, and I know that's right, the right wing populism, but is very cosmopolitan in that perspective, also through popular culture. But I do think that, I, uh, we'll get to you, Chris, uh, in a minute. Um, I mean, I do think, though, that, um, and I agree with you, that there is very much sort of the, a, a European sort of generation among those who are younger who have grown up, you know, in a time where everything, no borders, no borders right, where there has been mobility and, you know, movement of people and culture and, and all of these kinds of things. But I do still think, and, you know, I think we've kind of heard this um, again, and we see this, you know, as well with all, of, you know, sort of these anti-immigration uh, movements and things like that, things like Pegida and things like that, that uh, while in general, yes, the younger generation is sort of more European because of how they've grown up, there really is still sort of, um, it's still very much affected by where, you know, who you are and where you are and how you were socialized. Well, and and socioeconomic, and that's a big yeah. problem, you yeah. know, that for a lot of, if you, if you're in Germany, overall, you have right now a very good chance to get a job, mm -hmm. yeah? But if you're in Spain, it's a very different issue and that, that can be exploited. And one thing we haven't talked about that is the mediation of Europe to the media. And that happens often in a very nationalistic way, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, this is something we haven't talked about, but particularly for what Christoph said, those Europeans do not want to be mobile. You know, the imagined community, how's that talked about? And you know, there's a lot of bad press for the EU. Mm -hmm. And that shapes also people's mm -hmm. perception of this community in which they might not partake through mobility, but which they are part of. Mm -hmm. Who would like to jump in, Teresa? <laughs> Something yeah. that we have not discussed at all so far is um, the conditions under which people actually do an ex uh, exchange program. And we already talked, okay, there are some for whom it's financially more viable than for others. And uh, okay, it's different if you come from Eastern Europe, for example, there's quite some interesting research by Adrian Favell who shows that Eastern European mi movers have much less positive experience because they're usually just seen as, as you know, uh, people who will take away your job. But I think one thing that is crucial and that so far is maybe less addressed in the studies is, for example, how many other people from your country are also at the university, at the host university? Um, do you share an apartment with people from the host country or with other Erasmus students or with people from your own country? Um, so being Austrian, there was usually no other Austrian <laughs> In the place I was, <laughs> it was easy for me. I was usually just put in a in some kind of you know corner with all the Germans. But I did see that you know if you were actually coming from a bigger country, uh, people were much more likely to to you know hang out with the people from your own country, which of course has huge impact on so many other things like on whether you actually learn the language of the country that you're going to, or whether you improve your language there, um, you know, whether you will actually have this European experience or whether, to the contrary, you just have a very national experience. And I mean, I, I also um, saw sometimes students saying something like, yeah, um, actually by going to Italy, I became aware of how German I am. and." Uh, 
you know, they were actually more reinforcing their, their own national identity because they got completely annoyed at, you know, these typical things of, you know, a bit less, uh, you know, people being less on time or, you know, these typical stereotypes, people were very much, you know, reconfirming them sometimes. So I think it would be interesting to do more research also really on looking at, at, at these kind of conditions um, of, you know, do you share an apartment with, with people from your own country or, or host country? Um, do you get other opportunities to really interact? Um, in a lot of universities, what they do is actually they provide um, entire classes in English for foreign yeah. students. Because, you know, you cannot expect a student to learn Finnish in, you know, in one semester well enough to actually take classes. <laughs> so, again, here you have a, a clear, clear distinction between local and, and, you know, local students and, and the international students. Um, so, I think this is some, something where research could, could advance. And I think it's also, it would be interesting to also make, and I mean, Florian already uh, replicated some data. It would be interesting to really make a meta-analysis of the studies that are there, you know. Also look at unpublished papers, etc., because um, maybe uh, some of this, the effects are maybe understated because these groups are too small, etc. So I think this is something that would be very interesting to, to pursue as a research agenda also. Yeah. I'd like to give our audience, both here at Pitt and remotely, a chance to ask questions. Um, I know we could continue talking for a while, but uh, are there any any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, I had a question which you guys uh, started to kind of address, like near the end of issues with language. Um, how much of a barrier do you think that initial needing to learn a second language to participate in either study abroad or Erasmus student programs is. Um, and the kind of um, idea I get from it, both with my own experience with Erasmus students before and this discussion is that the expectation is that these students will need to know English or something along those lines in order to participate and go to a, a university abroad. Well, I guess I would say my experience has been yeah, English is de facto the lingua franca among the European youth. And I think what Teresa said is very important. I thought about that too, doing a little bit of research how people house that, that place in a role. Even if you're housed with other European students, usually English becomes the primary language. Um, and I, one thing I wanted to add to Teresa, I think the universities, European-wide with European um, you know, classes of excellence, blah, 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 feed into that, of course, very, um, I mean, structurally speaking, if you look at the structure, because it has become sort of a high coveted credential to offer these courses. Um, but it prevents exactly what Teresa said, then the possibility to really engage with the host culture. Just to piggyback on that, the other thing that I was thinking about in terms of language, sort of from our end, thinking from the American sender perspective, is that um, you know the Erasmus program and facilitating these these courses all in English has had the net effect of increasing our students' enrollment. You know, universities in America sending in the United States sending, and I'm imagining there's a similar effect for other Anglophone non-European countries, so Canada and Australia. And I'm wondering if that just enhances the sort of cosmopolitanism. I I, I don't know what kinds of, you know, living situations there are, but how many non-Europeans are there that are all speaking English um, for that mm -hmm. reason? Anyone would like to respond or? I don't have more data, but, you know, more anecdotal evidence, the German universities have on economics or political science, even in English departments, would teach the majority of their courses in the 80s and throughout the 90s in German. In the 2000s, we see particularly economics, political science, um, enormous numbers of courses taught in English. The argument being, of course, also that these uh, young Germans need to hone their uh, English in professional English. Teresa? Teresa? Yeah, I think there are different uh, countries in the EU have very different strategies. Um, the, 
Dutch universities are very keen on actually attracting international students because uh, the student numbers actually pay a big part of, of you know, what is going on in the university. So, for example, uh, the University of Amsterdam, our department has just introduced also an English-speaking bachelor program. We already had an English-speaking um, uh, um, MA program, but now we also um, teach courses in English for bachelors. And uh, one clear rationale behind it is uh, we want to attract more students both from the European Union but also from, uh, from abroad, because especially the students from abroad um, are charged much higher fees than, than the other European ones. It's not necessarily always a, you know, um, budget equal situation um, because it's sometimes very difficult to uh, to integrate people with very various backgrounds international backgrounds into um, into one program um, but this is something um, that a lot of Dutch universities are, are currently doing um, also um, with the context of Brexit uh, we also see that you know universities are getting interested in actually uh, attracting students who would usually go to the UK but are now a bit wary of you know the consequences of Brexit for for Europeans living in the UK so also here universities are trying to to attract uh, this group of people and it's it in also includes US students other questions yeah, right. yeah and so um, you're starting to actually get in an area that I wanted to ask about and that is you've been focused largely on the students but also somewhat on the institutions and i'm wondering if you might be able to say something more about the institutions uh, and in particular i guess uh, i'm intrigued by the fact that um, before world war ii the 19th and um, first half of the 20th century um, educational institutions were largely national and uh, educators were highly conservative in many ways um, and so Although, although people studied internationally, it wasn't with this aspiration to be Europeans, per se. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, could you say something more about the motivations now of the setting institutions? Right now we're talking about economic logics, um, but um, what, what's the advantage to, to, to set up situations in which you send your students abroad? Why? Christoph, do you want to respond? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what's the advantage? I think um, universities are also ranked because of their internationalization uh, activities. Uh, one of the things is the number of people or of students that go abroad with exchange programs. So, uh, of course, attracting students, it's economically beneficial if they come from outside the EU, but like promoting this Erasmus program uh, and, and, and sending students out for short-term exchange, it helps them to, yeah, to increase their, their relative ranking. Uh, within the within the EU, so I think that's the advantage because, just, yeah, well, because economically I, they don't gain. Mm -hmm. Is it is it then so so given what you were what you were articulating about the students, are you then saying that the institutions themselves are uh, low level Europeans who think about these things not in terms of Europe per se, but in terms of um, other things. It's not a matter of politics, it's a matter of how do I get my students to be able to research at CERN uh, or something like that. Mm. Yeah, I think it's an end. Universities are enterprises, no? So they, they yeah. handle out of, uh, of their own interest in a, in a world which is yeah, uh, increasingly competitive. So I think that's that's uh, or that's how I see the the yeah the like like very simplified the nature of uh, uh, why institutions act in such a way or at least higher education institutions. Well, I would agree. Teresa. Just a second here. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's the neoliberal conditions. The universities have to comply with it now too. I mean, that's why I said, was it called excellence clusters or what is it? I mean, the ranking in pre-European plays a big role now. I think in how the institution acts. Teresa. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I've worked in different institutions in different countries and in all of these institutions, internationalization was somewhere on the agenda, either, I mean, higher or less high, but it was clearly one of the, the points that all these institutions wanted to get ahead, you know, to actually 
attract more students, and have more exchanges on all different kinds of levels. In the Netherlands, one reason why, why um, universities are also keen on having um, more foreign exchange or foreign students is that the actual number of, of local students is actually decreasing um, because of you know generational uh, yeah of, of, of um, democratic demographic changes. So also here, you know, the idea is okay. We have to get a bigger pool. Um, of, of students from, from all over the world. Um, what you do, however, also see is um, in some areas some kind of you know, negative reactions. So um, in Austria, there is a lot of German students um, studying medicine because it's easier to actually <laughs> enter Austrian, mm. Austrian uh, universities for medicine than in, uh, in Germany. And this has um, created quite some, you know, political debates about the issue. It has even, you know, gone to the European Court of, of Justice because Austria at some point really limited the, the numbers of, you know, foreign students in, in studying medicine in Austria, medical studies, and which was, of course, against European non-discrimination law. Um, but here the, the, the public discourse was a lot like, okay, we are actually using Austrian taxpayer money to, uh, to you know, provide education to foreign students who will then go again back to Germany. They take away student places from, you know, potential Austrian doctors. We will have brain drain uh, and uh, not be able to actually, um, you know, establish a good, viable, and resilient healthcare system because we, you know, we actually, you know, educate doctors for other countries but not for ourselves. And this is an issue, I think, uh, similar discussions have been between the Netherlands and Belgium, which has a lot of, you know, students going from one country to the other. Um, and I'm sure it also happens in, in other countries uh, in the European Union. That, that have the same language um, that are usually next to each other, where this is much more facilitated. Florian, do you uh, want to respond to anything that's been discussed? Uh, I just wanted to add that it's not uh, sure whether uh, Britain will participate uh, in the Erasmus uh, program um, after it will exit the, exit the EU, and it's one of the things that are on the table. So it's not clear what the situation is, and I think that's quite something. So it's some of the things that uh, it's one of the things that uh, Theresa May mentioned in her speech in Florence that the UK might actually um, want to participate in programs that are mutually beneficial, and Erasmus might be one of them. But it's not clear. So this is um, quite something that's I think meaningful for for um, at least here for for the situation in Britain. But Florian, don't you think that that's one of the areas where they might be successful simply because we have actually a larger number of countries participating than the actual EU member states? You know, so I could see there, in comparison to other things, a possibility. Because you know, you have Turkey since 2004 participating, worse than on the table because of the Erdogan regime. But you know, it seems to me that's an area where maybe it will work out, whereas other things I see mm -hmm. more problems. Or let's hope for the sake of the young British people. Yeah, I completely well, I agree. But but this is why I was surprised to find, and I checked it before for before this roundtable here. Um, I was surprised that Theresa May did not specifically say she absolutely wants to keep the program in place. It is just one of the things that will be negotiated. And, and yeah, so we'll see negotiations about a lot of things. Uh, this being one of them. Yeah. Maybe the young Europeans should be on the streets. If the young British people didn't vote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> protest that they could stay in our yeah, That's very true. Well, we're just about out of time. I would love to, I know there's lots more to discuss, but I think uh, um, uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, participants, for um, participation. Um, I know for um, three of you, it's, it's quite late in the evening. So uh, thank you very much for um, joining us.
Um, uh, uh, so they can have a drink, you have to have a coffee. That's very true. <laughs> well, that. um, this has been a great discussion, and I, I, I think I'm leaving here with perhaps more uh, more questions, which is always always quite good. But I want to thank everyone, and I also want to just remind everyone as well that um, all of our participants are, are working and researching um, in this area. And so, for those of you that are in the audience, if you would like to to learn more, um, I encourage you to follow, um, uh, check out the websites of, of our participants and see what they're doing and where their research is going. Because I think this is a question that we're gonna be uh, continually thinking about um, in, the, in the years to come as we, as we think about the, the um, uh, as European identity and uh, European integration, the transnational community and all of these things um, continue to be a very relevant part of the discussion. So um, thank you again. And uh, thank you to you, Oxford Station, for getting us all together. You're welcome. <laughs>